So to tie all of this up, I'm going to talk to us about the right to effective intervention. Now, caring for individuals that have got special needs and people that have autism is um, very tricky and delicate. But there are some things that we need to put in place before we can actually do this. And I've narrowed them down into six. So first, being properly trained um, professionals, the technicians that work with these individuals on a daily basis, having a program that's implemented and monitored by the right professionals, and policies, policies, government policies, policies in the workplace, parental training, they have to have that training done as well. Patients' right to evidence-based service, and then the person-centered service. What do I mean by properly trained technicians? These are the people that work with these individuals, the children or persons with autism on a day-to-day -day basis, implementing programs that have been designed. So you have a diagnosis, you have assessments, and following that, programs are developed that will help close the gaps and transfer skills that these individuals are learning. So these technicians need to be properly trained in how to decipher those programs and then use them to train up these individuals in skill acquisition. And whilst they're doing that, they need to be supervised. And that's where program implementation and monitoring comes in. So they just don't take the program and run off on their own. People need to be supervised. So for instance, if you're working with me, I need to develop that program. I need to see that you're implementing it properly because the skill transfer process is akin to dispensing medication. And we'll agree that if we dispense the wrong medication, that individual, in this sense, can either be damaged or just stagnated. So we want to monitor what's being done to be sure that the program is being implemented correctly, effectively, and efficiently. And that's done through data gathering, and then we review the data and we move on. The next step would be, okay, so we've trained all these people and we've designed the program. Do we have policies in place that would actually guide all of this? And that's where we believe not just the organizational policies come in, but we also have government policies. What are we doing as a people? What are we doing as a nation? What's out there? Are there guidelines? My colleagues have touched a little bit on that, but we're thinking of are there bodies, are there organizations that have been empowered to have an oversight on what's going on, how these individuals, how the children are being handled. And then talk about the parents. It will be good for parents to enlighten themselves. We can't overemphasize that. And I say to people, there are 24 hours in a day. If I, as a service provider, a teacher, or you know, working on skill acquisition, I have your child for eight hours, there are still 16 hours left that you're going to spend. So unless you give your child petidine, okay, they're going to be awake for at least eight hours of a day. But without the petidine, they can, you know, I mean, or you give them, they sleep for the 16 hours or probably tap them to eat. So the more the parents are trained to recognize the child's need and not stay on the path of it's not my portion, the better they are able to see what's going on with their child and also implement the same program and the same plan when that service provider is in there. Now, for Advocacy, the patient's, the child's right is paramount and they must be um, treated, that's the word we use, or the intervention, the program must be evidence-based. What do I mean by that? You have to use um, skill acquisition strategies that have been proven to be successful. They've been tested, research has gone on, it's been documented. We'll take, for instance, the science of applied behavior analysis. There are a lot of people, charlatans, walking around and saying, oh, I'm an ABA practitioner, I'm a therapist, I'm a this, I'm a that. Nothing wrong with that. But again, for parents, you need to be asking the question, what are you doing? How are you implementing this plan? How is my child going to get better? Where is the evidence? 
not sufficient to just go on Google or YouTube or wherever and pull up something. Yes, these are all nice. You get some information from it. But we need to know what you're doing. It's got to be research driven, not hearsay. Okay, and then ensure that the service you're providing is person centered. Now, what do we mean by that? That individual that you're working with, you've got to take their opinion into account, especially as they get older. If it's a two year old, three year old, a minor, yes, the parent comes in because they are the ones giving consent. But when the child is deemed to have capacity, it's important that we have a discussion with that child, that individual, that learner, and ask questions. How do you want this to be done? Or this is what I'm about to do. What do you think of it? And so on and so forth. And it's not, again, for person-centered service, it's not about the mother, father, greater family. Yes, they're important as part of the clientele, but it is about that individual that is on the spectrum that has the need. We need to ensure that whatever we're doing, we carry them along and everything is about that person. It's not about the parent's emotion, I'm sorry to say, but about the child's own emotion and needs. Legend in the building. Legend. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that any viewer watching that, what your, your piece just then, who just happens to be at the right place at the right time watching this, just received their blessing. Um, you hit on so many important points, and I think sometimes that the emphasis on the role the parent plays is not enough. We know you're the parent, you're looking after the child, but actually in the intervention of the child. Parenting is just not, you know, clothing the child, making sure that they're eating. It's actually in getting involved in the academics, in the education, and for children who are on the spectrum and have other um, needs, actually getting involved in um, the interventions. But why do you think so many parents are kind of head in the sand are so resistant because Mr. Adebomehin, Zuzi, Ezia Fakaku, you must hit this wall every day of the week. What do you do when parents who, let, let's just say, are often the problem, how do you approach it? Because at the end of the day, it's the child that we're looking out for. Okay. Um, there are quite a number of ways that I'm aware of. One of them is to Sometimes you've had to go around the parent to work with the child, hoping that by the time the child begins to make the progress, the parent comes on board. And that has happened a number of times, really. And another way is to um, give them the exposure to listen to experts so that they are able to tie the pieces together. They don't need anybody then to come in and tell them, I think there's something happening here with Peter. You know, because if you've heard people talk about it, the people who know, you've heard different case studies, then you're able to fall in line and we find that those ways actually do work. Okay. I would add to that and I would say that, um, yes, we meet those kind of parents. We meet the, those parents often. And I would use an example. There's this little, there's this little light at the center. I will call them lights, by the way. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> doing great, then something happened and we noticed a behavior contract. Behavior contractors at different um, environment, different setting. The child knows what's what was right at this setting. Oh, this is the center. I will behave well. I will behave appropriately. But as soon as I leave the center, oh yes, <laughs> uh, no one is watching me here, and I can behave the way I want to. At that point, I hit a brick wall. Like, what's going on? I know something changed, and I called up my supervisor, who's the legend, and I said, I. I actually presented the case, like, what's going on here? And the beautiful thing about ABA is evidence-based, data-driven, it's observable. And we've been collecting data. We could pinpoint the exact time when those behavior contracts began. And then we invited the parents. The evidence speaks for Evidence you. speaks for the, itself. And... At that point, the parents knew, oh, this is what happened. 
so can we not? Because we can't keep dancing around the parents. The truth is, they would spoil your work. The parents can spoil <laughs> your work. You've been working so hard. And now, the parents are doing certain things. When you have data, you have evidence, you have everything just right in front, then the parents know that, oh, this actually is my fault. It's okay. not. So I have one quick thing to okay. say, mm -hmm. and I think that is what I find missing with service providers. The minute you have someone that has walked in and you're about to start um, with, you know, providing intervention with the child, I feel like the intervention should not be just for the child. When we are making intervention, at mm -hmm. the back of our mind, that plan that you're drawing up should also say on X amount of times or hours, you as the parents have to have X number of training, X number of... Because mm. only until we do that, before we can have a holistic approach. So, when if you were coming to our center, for instance, mm. the first thing that we do, I mean, apart from once you've read the contract, you are not starting until you read the contract. And the contract stipulates that the parent and every individual in that organism space yes. must be trained yes. and the minimum training the parents get is the behavior technician level training so we have people who get the train and i we ask them who are the significant others recently we had a grandmother the nanny the caregiver in the house mommy everybody five of them from the family do the training yes. so we don't for our sense i don't know about others but that's what we mean about the parent training yeah. so everybody has to get trained okay so as long as you're in that individual space we demand and for us it's not just about the training Okay, so as we're collecting data in the center, you're collecting data at home. at home. We give you the exact same plan. So if we say today, we're working on sitting down for two minutes or 20 seconds, you get the exact same thing to do at Absolutely. home. Absolutely. And we call in our parents, we call them to order. We've had people and <laughs> our own parents know, the parents that come to us for service, they know some of them go, oh, oops, am I in trouble? And I'm like, yes, you are. I say to them, we've had your child for X period of time. These are the milestones. Look at the data, okay? And like you say, see when it starts. Are you satisfied with what progress your child has made? If your response is yes, then please, it's time to end the contract and the relationship but most times they don't they want more so yes i hear you and that's what i mean by parent training getting the right thing everybody has to be on board i could add to that briefly and say that um with aba we'll say whose behavior are you really looking at we are looking at the behavior of the individual so the intervention yes everyone has to be on board we're all looking at the behavior of that organism not the behavior. I don't really, it's not my business that the parent wants to <laughs> go off their way. As mm -hmm. long as they are trained mm -hmm. and the right person, the right caregiver is there. It's so, the primary yes, person. Yes, it's the primary the person. Because the focus for me is the organism. Yeah. Yes. yes. But then you can't really get to the organism if you don't take all the stakeholders in into consideration. Into consideration. Sure. Yeah. I think it's the chicken and the egg <laughs> thing. Yes. I know. A lovely conversation to keep going, but we're going to go on a short break, and when we come back, Doreen Shola will be up.